Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's amazing uh, to be here. For me, I think after two years standing at this podium, it's a wonderful feeling. Thank you for being part of this evening. I'm Rahul Mehrotra, Chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design. And I want to begin by acknowledging uh, that the Harvard Graduate School of Design is located on the traditional and the ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. The school also recognizes the work of the Harvard University Native American program in cultivating the relationships that, lead, uh, that led to the creation of this acknowledgment. Before we jump into tonight's event, uh, for those who are connected virtually, a quick reminder that we have live captioning available for our virtual audience. Uh, to enable captions, click the closed captioning button at the bottom of the live stream window. So with that, uh, let's start. Uh, I want to actually start by apologizing on behalf of uh, two participants, uh, Sunil Kilnani, who couldn't be with us, and Hitesh Hathi, who is the new executive director of the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute. And he just texted me a message. So I'm sorry, I'm going to try to build that into my comments. But here, he sort of asked for his apologies to be presented. Uh, and he's also invited everyone to be part of these conversations which I hope will go the year long. It's a project that I'll talk about in a second. But he also extends an invitation to everyone here because he felt you'd be interested uh, to an exhibit at the Mittal Institute, which is across the street, that looks at another part of material culture in South Asia, objects connected with the migration that followed the partition of 1947. And the show is called Reclaiming and Retelling. And a visiting artist, uh, Mehwish Abid, who is here in the audience, uh, looks at how homes in South Asia are decolonized and recreated by reinterpreting the objects in them. So uh, he sort of extends that invitation. And thanks to uh, Hitesh for that. And the other participant, Sunil Kilnani, also couldn't um, be with us. Uh, they both tested positive. They're all well. Uh, but uh, they didn't want to expose everyone who would be here. So they excused myself them, themselves. So. In any case, this event is organized by the Lakshmi Mittal Family South Asia Institute, the Graduate School of Design, and the Museum of Modern Art in New York, MoMA, with its current exhibition, which is titled The Project of Independence, Architecture Architectures of Decolonization in South Asia from 1947 uh, to 1985. Uh, this, uh, I mean, the exhibition actually served as an occasion in talking to Martino and his colleagues at, uh, the, at MoMA uh, to kind of have a conversation around it. Uh, and we felt talking about the conservation of modern architecture would be appropriate for very various reasons that will unfold, I hope, <laughs> in, during the evening. So I'd like to thank Martino and Evan Gallus uh, for partnering for this, in this event uh, with us at the GSD, and also to Hitesh and Selman Rafi for making this happen, and the GSD team, Paige Johnson, Kat uh, Chavez, uh, many thanks to them all. Today, uh, with this first event at the GSD and in collaboration with the South Asia Institute, we are also launching a multi-year project to look at the state of architecture in South Asia. Uh, and this is going to be a project that will run over three years, uh, is the plan. And it will involve looking at contemporary practices through a lecture series. It will look at the modalities of practice in making architecture in South Asia, which will be a series of podcasts, uh, and then a conference which will cap this all, and we hope to actually convert this into also a traveling exhibition in South Asia. And Aishna Prasad and Pranav Tole are part of this team and have contributed, and from the South Asia Institute, Selman Rafi and Colin Carl, who have helped us formulate this. So you'll hear more from all of us as this sort of unfolds. And, and we hope this project will actually be collaborative. We are already uh, you know, uh, cementing partnerships within South Asia with 
with other collaborating institutes. And Martino, I hope we will connect and see how MoMA might also continue to be part of the conversations that we kick off today. In any case, today's event is uh, focused on the conversations about conservation and is titled Conservation in a Shifting Landscape, the Future of Modern Architecture in South Asia. This period, and this is an image of the MoMA catalog that you see, because this period that they've chosen to base the exhibition on, which is 1950 to 85, saw exemplary examples of architecture in the South Asian region, some of which are being celebrated uh, in the show. And Martino is going to share some of those images with us uh, from the show. And it's, it, it's, it's the first transnational show focused on the region, uh, which is very important. And while these projects that they've included in the show, and some of which you'll see today, uh, were an integral part of the nation building agenda and the construction of national identity at the time, more recently, these buildings have begun to come under threat with political and social shifts in the region. Recently, the Hall of Nations, which is the image you see here, uh, uh, designed by Raj Rival and Mahendra Raj, uh, who was a structural engineer, uh, who is a structural engineer. And they are both sort of, it's a critically acclaimed project, a post-colonial project, known for being the world's first and largest space frame structure built in concrete. This was demolished overnight, rather recently. And this act invited much outrage and triggered an entire debate on what the architectural and cultural significance of such projects might, uh, might be, uh, you know, projects that one could call works of art of national importance. Ever since Louis Kahn's IIM, Indian Institute of Management project at Ahmedabad, the dormitory specifically, and Charles Correa's project called the Color Academy in Goa were among several buildings that have similarly come under threat. So I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about these three projects, because in a sense, they're emblematic of the range of issues that we might uh, discuss uh, in the panel today and through the other presentations. So the Hall of Nations, which was built in 1972, was significant for the reasons I just described. And it's an ensemble of various pavilions uh, at different scales and meant for exhibitions. These were venues for exhibitions built in 1972. Uh, and uh, it was designed by Mahendra Raj, a well-known structural engineer uh, who is in his 90s now uh, and has been active till very recently. And it was really for the International Trade Fair in New Delhi. In 2017, uh, we as a profession and citizens woke up to find it was gone. It was demolished. Uh, so the question is here, what was the constituency? I mean, of course, architects wrote and spoke about it. I didn't hear much much uh, noise from citizens, in a sense. So its constituency was, was it really architects? I'm posing these as, as questions. The Delhi Urban Arts Commission, INTAC, which is a conservation body, a national body, uh, of course, was vocal about it. Uh, but there was an outrage in the way one would expect. And so uh, I felt really as an architect in the country in an echo chamber worrying about a building like this. It's a really significant building. And so this was national. Uh, it was owned by the government. Uh, it was in Delhi, in the capital, uh, perhaps had incredible national significance in our post-independence um, uh, era and all of that. Chandigarh, Dhaka, the parliament, I think would face similar kinds of threats and issues over time. Uh, the second building uh, in 1961 by Louis Kahn, uh, the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, is very interesting. It's complicated by the fact that you have a well-known international architect. What is its constituency? Uh, of course, it's, 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 it's local. Uh, it's the students, the alum, the faculty. But it also was the result of local patronage, which was very important because Ahmedabad was put on the map for modern architecture through the significant patronage it found. And so you have patronage, which is enlightened. You have a constituency of elite users, in a sense, of faculty and students that come out of it. Uh, and uh, uh, 
you know, it, it is also another one of those buildings, the dormitories particularly, these are sketches from the archives uh, of the different sort of projects. It composes of classrooms, dormitories, uh, administrative buildings. I happened to be there five days ago and spent three or four hours inspecting the buildings and it is a complicated project uh, and one that's going to be a challenge to conserve, but the more important thing is the will and how one builds that momentum is a question. Uh, and of course, this uh, it, it, it um, created outrage in the press, internationally too, uh, and also locally. Uh, but you know, I must admit it was largely within uh, the circles of academics, uh, of practitioners, uh, and of a certain kind of uh, uh, elite uh, within the country that recognizes its value both as architecture but also the forms of patronage. Uh, and of course, these were saved. Uh, they're not being used. They were just put on hold. Uh, the institute decided to just put it all on hold, the demolition, rightly so, and think about how they might proceed. And this is going to be very, and that's why a conversation like this is important because it will inform these conversations as they go along. Uh, and, uh, and the third building is a building which is very local to Goa. Uh, it's the Kala Academy designed by Charles Correa in 1970. And here, it's a kind of different story. Uh, it's a building that's used very locally. I was speaking to someone the other day and they said anyone who learned how to play the piano in Goa would have gone to the Kala Academy. Uh, and so when the Charles Correa Foundation uh, heard about its demolition, they sent out a notice and within a few hours they had 25,000 signatures from the local citizens. There was a lot of pressure on the high court locally and the government actually uh, stopped the demolition. Uh, it's a center for crafts. It was, it's an interesting building because it was what I would describe as Charles Correa trying to uh, negotiate postmodernism, which had begun to evolve in the West, which he was aware was. This was his version of how he began to encompass, uh, integrate, sorry, imagery within it. In this case, Dishido and uh, you know mur murals. That's uh, that's that, that little sketch there shows Khan and Cobb in conversation. Uh, but it's a building loved and used by the local sort of population and citizens. The auditorium has sketches by Mario Miranda, who was a famous Goan cartoonist of you know, the elite in Goa looking over this auditorium, but it also represents the different, you know, uh, communities uh, in Goa. So it has overlays uh, which communicate to a, a local audience in a different way. And so these are, this is a spectrum of modernism in a sense uh, within the post-independence sort of era. And this building was saved from uh, that demolition. So the question is, in a place like, in a region like South Asia, there's a diversity of, in terms of the forms uh, that even modernism took, uh, all the way from Nepal, those are Karl Prusa's building, less known, and some of the others I think many of you would recognize. And I think this is a question Martino will also touch upon because they dealt with this when they uh, were curating uh, the exhibition. So with that, I, I just want to kind of put on the table two or three issues which I hope we can pick up uh, in the conversation. Uh, and the first is, uh, you know, this notion of the national narratives versus local narratives and their effectiveness when we are talking about conservation. Also in post-colonial conditions, which one might ext extend even to transitions that occur uh, in uh, political ideologies, is the notion of, you know, when the creators of an environment and the custodians of an environment, whether they're the political class or otherwise, are different, you almost need different narratives, right? Uh, because what what, what drives the conservation uh, is, is quite different. And so even in moments of transition, as Yves Blau describes, from socialism to capitalism or neoliberalism, the narratives change within the politi political elite in terms of why anything might want to be saved. The other question, which is uh, an interesting one, is the idea that in many parts, well, in all of South Asia, but many other parts of the world, parts of Africa, Latin America, aesthetic modernity kind of arrived before the social modernization project. And Sibel Bozdegon, the scholar, has written about this in the context of Turkey. But it's an important question uh, because um, this inversion, uh, of course, creates a completely different relationship 
uh, with people uh, and these sorts of buildings. And then it's also about how this plays out on a kind of national scale. And this is just uh, India, because my research is based there. And that is the spine of modernism. You see going from Chandigarh down to Goa, and Pondicherry was an exception. You simultaneously now, under our new liberalized regime, you have new uh, centers of capital accumulation, uh, which have completely different protocols and don't work with the traditions within the architectural craft or trade uh, that were established by modernism. And it's a completely different kind of architecture that emanates. And as the smaller towns grow around it, they are completely different sort of contingencies that, do, that drive the style stylistic uh, impulses. Uh, or this example of Chandigarh, which is wonderful, where on World Yoga do Day, it gets colonized for yoga. This is the plaza. You see the assembly buildings uh, in the background. Uh, it's a, a temporal overlay of different meaning, which gives it another kind of significance, uh, which is interesting uh, and worth noting as we d discuss these sorts of narratives. And then the question of how con uh, conservation is really an instrument of planning, which allows any society to modulate the rate of change uh, and to slow change. This is a book, uh, this is a diagram from Rem Koolhaas's Contents, where he basically establishes how the, the interval between the object and the moment of preservation is actually collapsing. Uh, and now, you know, since we were looking at the 1960 revision and looking at 20th century architecture, it's, you know, it's often the same generation that built this. So one generation later, that there's an impulse uh, to uh, to conserve, and, and so what 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 does that mean? And so one can actually imagine uh, a time where civic authorities will decide if a building is worthy of conservation in advance of building sanctions for new architecture. In this way, conservation will be intrinsically tied up with the very conception of architecture and our cities at large, not as an ex post facto impulse. Conservation will be ahead of planning in a way, and perhaps we'll be even more confused about what we want to conserve. But at least we'll be thinking more clearly, clearly about the broader built environment in the present and speculating on the returns it will provide in the future. So then, becomes, then this becomes an interesting question of how might we refine what constitutes architectural history and heritage, given the current categorization of heritage sets a minimum time horizon of 100 years. Why does an act like demolition or proposed destruction of modern architecture and buildings not spark more public outcry in South Asia, but many parts of the world? How can modern buildings be re rethought not only as, a historical, as historical remnants, but active backdrops for contemporary life? What might qualify as works of art of national importance today? More importantly, what narratives might we develop to anchor the importance of such buildings in the public awareness once again, so that transitionary political agendas and bureaucratic constraints are not left to determine their fate? What strategies and interpretations must the practice of conservation device to include to help cope with an increasingly contested and transitionary landscape that characterizes the region of South Asia now. So I go back to South Asia in ending. And this is a collage, and so was the earlier collage by David Wild, uh, who sort of uh, you know, uh, created these collages around modern architecture. And here you see the Sarabai house designed by Corbusier with his overlays uh, you know, of colors to celebrate holy, but also images from the Renaissance and European art. Because post-independent South Asia, Although apparently closing the debate on architecture and identity using modernism did not produce the society for which the region had hoped and yearned. Instead, all efforts were directed towards dealing with the splintered society and that the different nations had inherited. Societies fractured by caste, class, economic disparities, rural and urban divides, and a multitude of beliefs and religious affiliations which were welded together as nation states. It becomes overwhelming overwhelmingly evident in retrospect that during these years that aesthetic modernity seemed to have arrived before social modernity through a small community of architects who had become host to these new ideas. And to work within this highly complex entity of South Asia, notions of cultural significance need to be broadened to respond to a highly pluralistic society where cultural memory is often an enacted process. In conservation debates within this dynamic context, it is perhaps necessary to focus even more intensely 
on the notion of constructing significance. In fact, an understanding of how significance evolves will truly clarify the role of the conservational professional from being taught as one who opposes change to one who manages or facilitates change. In the case of the latter, a conservator would be seen as an agent not only of returning, uh, retaining what survives from the past, but also giving expression to contemporary aspirations. So conservation in a shifting landscape is the beginning of conversations to convene leading scholars uh, working on architecture in South Asia to discuss this very question. The challenge is really to reconceptualize conservation practice in the face of such threats and current attitudes. MoMA's current exhibition focused on the architectural history of the region between 1947 and 85 throws light on these endangered projects, illustrating their importance not just in the region's history, but also their contributions to the fields of architecture and the culture of building more generally in South Asia and beyond. And so with that, I'm going to introduce the panelists in order of their presentation. Uh, Martino Sterli is the Philip Johnson Chief Curator of Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art, New York, a role he assumed in 2015. He oversees the a wide-ranging program of special exhibitions, installations, and acquisitions of the Department of Architecture and Design. And he's organized and co-curated exhibitions on a variety of topics. Uh, I'll just sort of name a few. Uh, Las Vegas Studio, images from the archives of Robert Venturi and Dennis Scott Brown, uh, and the architecture of hedonism, three villas in the island of Capri. Uh, uh, also, uh, more recently, towards a new concrete utopia architecture in Yugoslavia from 1948 to 1980, and now the project of independence of uh, the, uh, the most recent one, architectures of decolonization colonization in South Asia. Our second speaker will be Kathleen James Chakrabarti, and she's a professor of art history at the University College in Dublin. She currently also in, is an uh, Ilesa Mellon Bruce Senior Fellow at the Center of Advanced Studies in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art. Art. Her books include Architecture Since 1400 Miss Minnesota, which was press, Minnesota Press in 2014, and Modernism as Memory, Building Identity in the Federal Republic of Germany, as well as edited collections of Bauhaus culture from Weimar to the Cold War, and a book, India in Art in Ireland. And she was awarded the European Research Council Advanced Grant for a project entitled Expanding Agency, Women, Race, and the Global Dissemination of Modern Architecture. And uh, Eve Blau, who we all know, is going to moderate this conversation. She teaches history and theory of urban form and design at, at the GSD, where she's a director of research and co-director of the Harvard Mellon, Mellon Urban Initiative. She has written extensively, and if I begin to start listing the books, uh, this is going to take a lot of time. Uh, but uh, most people in this audience know her books, and most recently, she was awarded, and well, not recently, but 2015, she was awarded the Victor Alder State Prize by the Republic of Austria for a contribution to the history of social movements. And in 2018, she was named the Fellow of the Society of Architectural Historians. So with that, Martino, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Rahul, for the um, wonderful introduction and excellent uh, collaboration. I'm so happy that we are able to do this tonight together in person. And it's um, also really lovely to be back at the GSD and to see old friends and make new friends. And with that, um, I think Raul has set the table very nicely. I'm going to continue setting the table, but from a different perspective by, you know, just trying to give a brief overview of some of the curatorial thinking be behind the project of independence, architectures of decoloni decolonization in South Asia, and um, which will hopefully lead us to um, some of the questions that are, that are relevant for uh, the topic this evening, which is the question of the preservation of the modernist heritage. Um, I am beginning here with um, a photograph that shows the entry into the exhibition on the museum's third floor. If you're familiar with MoMA, uh, you would sort of walk across this uh, bridge and to the right, just out of the picture, would be the helicopter, which sort of marks the realm of architecture and design at the museum, or has historically marked. And um, we've put up this, pro this banner here, the Project of Independence, and I would like to start with maybe articulating 
the key um, objectives that we were trying to uh, bring across with the um, exhibition. And I think um, um, I would like to uh, dwell on three very briefly. So the first, um, perhaps most obvious uh, objective for us was to, um, you know, uh, start from a, a critical reassessment of the way architectural history has been written at the museum, but also in, you know, Western historiography until quite recently, which really has been very much um, a Euro and uh, North American centric understanding of the history um, of architecture, and it has left many, many blind spots across uh, the world and obviously this um, um, sort of dismantling of, um, of, of, of the dogmas of, of historiography has started a while ago in the academic world. Uh, the globalization of architectural history is well underway and has, you know, uh, really de uh, developed into a very sophisticated discourse. However, um, you know, in my conversations with members of the more general audience, you know, that message really hasn't fully um, arrived yet in the general audience and you know I think we as curators at the museum feel that it is our task to uh, you know really help change the perception as it stands there through many decades of teaching architectural history in institutions such as Harvard or MoMA. Um, obviously, um, you know, it's not just a regional uh, a, a sort of survey that we're attempting to uh, undertake that would be banal. Um, and I think I'm showing you here a map uh, of the, you know, contested territory uh, of part of South Asia that we're focusing on. It's that part of South Asia that was you know, part of the British Empire until 47 slash 48, when these four current present countries all, you know, became politically independent. And indeed, the nexus to politics is, you know, is an essential um, sort of part of the thesis of the show. The second objective really uh, to um, show that architecture was an instrument and in fact an active agent in the transformation of these former colonial societies into post-colonial self-determined ones by particularly looking at the first generation of architecture from the region or, you know, active in the region. And uh, so what we are trying to say is that architecture contributed actively to uh, articulating a powerful vision of a post-colonial society through an idea of built space. And this aspiration was expressed in new cities and spaces of political representation or in the construction of formally and typologically innovative building. Our exhibition showcases how architects, primarily from the region, responded to the social and material conditions on the ground and how they related their work to craft traditions and labor conditions unique to the subcontinent. And the third, um, uh, you know, primary objective for us brings us directly to, um, to the topic of our conversation tonight. Really, you know, to raise awareness for the incredible aesthetic quality and historical significance of this unique body of work that is modernism in South Asia. And this in a moment when many of these buildings are under acute threat of demolition or, uh, you know, disuse. So the question of preservation is very acute and it, I think, runs like a red line through the exhibition, even though it's never sort of, uh, you know, addressed as a, as a primary theme, it runs throughout the entire exhibition. So how is the exhibition structured? Um, Rahul has already mentioned it is a transnational undertaking, so we refrain from looking at countries specifically. We also are not adhering to a, st a strict chronology, but instead we decided to uh, focus um, on six primary topics uh, or themes, and each of them relates to um, a specific aspect of the built environment, the first of them being the construction of new cities. And um, I would just like to start here with a brief video um, showing um, 
you know, so, um, an aspect of Chandigarh, which uh, is generally less known. And, um, you know, obviously we're not starting the exhibition uh, of Chandi uh, with Chandigarh because Chandigarh and Le Corbusier, because Le Corbusier and Louis Kahn, while they are present in the exhibition, they're really not, the, you know, the, the primary uh, focus of our exhibition. But we wanted to show here is precisely how this project of, uh, you know, modernism was met on the uh, with very specific uh, conditions of of, of labor and uh, on the ground in 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 a place that you know really hadn't been industrialized yet so this this projective of I idea of what mo modernism uh, was in the region i think you know really gives it a unique flavor that you know could not have uh, you know was not part of of the story of modernism uh, anywhere in the world and you know we see here uh, these particularly, you know, interesting women, of course, on the construction site, also something we're not so familiar with in general, really carrying the freshly poured concrete uh, to the uh, construction site that, you know, would then be uh, the buildings that we're all very familiar with. The next um, theme, the second chapter of the exhibition, deals with um, houses and housing. It's called Templates for Living. And I'm showing you here uh, a few images, photographs uh, of the um, almost non-existent archive of the incredible Sri Lankan architect Minette de Silva. Minette de Silva was not only the first woman architect of her home country, she was also um, the first modernist architect of her home country. She preceded people like Jeffrey Bawa or uh, Valentine Gunasekra, who both um, you know, worked actually with her, trained with her uh, by uh, several years. And, um, you know, um, talking about preservation, the preservation of architectural archives is, of course, also something that is um, precarious, not only in South Asia, but ma in many parts of the world. In the case of Minette de Silva, there, is, there are literally no existing uh, original drawings. There are no models. We have a few um, historical photographs and we have some ephemeral uh, examples of her publications, of her work as a teacher and so on that we are bringing into the exhibition to really highlight her extraordinary significance for uh, architectural discourse in the region. Um, another figure um, um, in the same um, um, in the same uh, section is uh, Yasmin Lari, the Pakistani woman architect, like uh, Minette Silva, her, the first uh, licensed woman architect of Pakistan, actually active to the present day. She made very seminal contributions to the early sort of political representation of newly independent Pakistan, but also very much invested in housing. For example, here the Anguri Bagh housing in Lahore, um, you know, um, a really a refugee settlement project that dealt with the traumatic and catastrophic impact of partition on, you know, large parts of the population in the north of the subcontinent. Uh, we are bring, coming to the next uh, chapter, um, the um, industry and infrastructure. Um, so I, I said before that you know we're basically talking about agrarian uh, economies, societies that were you know pushed forward uh, through this uh, bold uh, political vision, and architecture was there to build up a, um, a whole. Uh, you know, infrastructure of infrastructure and industrial buildings. I'm showing here a project by Jeffrey Bawa, the um, uh, Steel Corporation office um, and houses in, in Sri Lanka. And um, then the next section, um, I'm showing you here a project that you've already seen that I'm sure that we'll come back to uh, in our conversation. It is sort of the key uh, project of the section on political spaces, of so the question of how does the state represent the newly independent nation state represent itself politically, for example, through the Hall of Nations. In the foreground, um, a beautiful model, which is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art, uh, that we were able to acquire from Roger Wall's office and in the background an incredible perspectival, perspectival drawing that is in the collection of the Centre Pompidou. And then again, uh, you know, a video that illustrates again the question of labor uh, 
and material culture on the ground and how uh, this incredible uh, feat of engineering came to be about uh, in 1972, um, marking the 25th anniversary of independence. Excellent. Then uh, we have uh, two more sections uh, um, in the exhibition. They're both dealing with institution building. The first one um, dealing specifically with educational institutions. We're calling the, the, the chapter the landscapes uh, of education. And I think if you look at this unbelievable drawing on the left uh, of a campus plan for Chittagong University by the Bangladeshi architect Muzarul Islam. You get a sense of what we mean by this idea of landscape. Not only was, you know, the educational, the institutional landscape of educational institutions transformed, but also really through these, you know, very large scale campus planning that were entirely new to the subcontinent at that time. The entire landscape of the country was also transformed, which I think is, you know, very beautifully illustrated in this drawing by Masrul Islam that really overlays this geometric abstraction uh, over, you know, this uh, mound um, landscape that is, you know, the natural territory of Bangladesh. And on the right, um, a housing project um, on um, uh, you know, as, uh, of, uh, a student housing project as part of that um, University planning, it looks like a ruin, it's actually a fully functional building, so the impact of the climate on modernism is maybe also something uh, we can talk about here, captured by a very atmospheric and, you know, really incredibly strong image by Randir Singh, whom we commissioned to produce a new photo portfolio, um, uh, you know, showing us how many of these buildings have aged and have become part of everyday life of, mon of so many, uh, you know, citizens of these four countries of South Asia. And just to wrap it up, uh, finally, institution building on a more general scale, the last chapter of the exhibition, really dealing with all kinds of typologies, for example, here a mosque in the foreground um, in, in Pakistan by Anwar Said in the new capital of Islamabad, or then, of course, Charles Correa and again Mahendra Raj, the incredible Mahendra Raj. Um, there were their um, Sardar Patel Municipal Stadium in Ahmedabad, which is on the World um, Monument Fund heritage list. And I think Rahul will have something to say about this project in particular. We also have a really incredible model built by students from the Cooper Union who um, have done incredible work and com contributed to the exhibition. What is an architectural exhibition? Of course, we always try to show architectural um, projects from a variety of, of, of angles using all kinds of different media. We have a number of original models, in particular here, um, a model of Sept uh, from Doshi's office, um, uh, um, uh, uh, an exhibition pavilion from Jaws Correa's uh, archive, and um, a stunning model of, you know, a vision of Oroville, um, a, an experimental community near Pondicherry, um, a project by Roger Angers. Then I already mentioned newly commissioned models built by the, uh, by the students of the Cooper Union um, that, you know, have proven very popular with our audiences. They really illustrate sort of the spatial imaginary of these projects. Of course, a wealth of archival drawings from all all kinds of hidden and less hidden places that were incredibly difficult to uh, bring to the museum. And I want to thank all my wonderful collaborators inside and outside of the museum who have made this possible. Then, of course, archival photographs, prints uh, of, of the buildings during or right after construction, as well as a number of uh, different, you know, found footage, videos that illustrate different aspects of moving through space, of how people were uh, imagining themselves at the space at the time, and so on and so forth. I already mentioned the photo commission that we uh, gave to Randir Singh, who came up really with an, a stunning portfolio, uh, a real record of, of many of these buildings. Um, and you can imagine how complicated it was to travel to all these places during the pandemic. So we are extremely happy that we are able to, sh to show um, you know, this additional aspect of how modernism has really become, you know, absorbed into everyday life in South Asia and how many of these buildings continue to be very actively used in the way they were supposed to be used, while others, of course, have fallen into uh, 
uh, disuse or you know have even been demolished. The catalogue has already been mentioned. It was important to us to not only have the uh, you know the voice of the curators uh, that you can see here, but uh, you know also to have a photographic portfolio, um, 40 pages uh, with some of the images that uh, you know Randir Singh took, but then also a whole. Uh, a number of thematic essays by scholars who have, you know, expertise on specific aspects. Rahul here present wrote on housing in particular. I'm showing here a double page spread um, of the essay dealing specifically with them. Um, with preservation, written by a wonderful colleague, Mina Rajagopalan, who brings into the conversation precisely this very interesting aspect that Rahul was also referencing to why is there no great outcry when some of these buildings are being destroyed, who are, is actually modern architecture for, um, what is you know, um, um, the, the um, relationship of architecture to, to, the, to the lives of the people that inhabit these places. And then finally, um, what we call transformative projects, um, a, a, you know, um, a brief um, introduction into 15 projects that we found particularly transformative um, to illustrate the history of modernism and modernity in the post-colonial period. And with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you so much. Good evening. You've seen this photograph before. First, I would like to thank Rahul and Martino for inviting me to participate this evening. It's also a great delight after 30 years to be back on a podium uh, at Harvard with Eve Blau again. Uh, a really, that's a special treat. As a mem sahib, I am, I admit, more than a bit self-conscious about recommending what others in a different part of the world might do to preserve the modern heritage that I so admire. But COVID plus issues of sustainability makes it more difficult for even Harvard to fly someone from halfway around the world to speak for 10 to 12 minutes. I will, however, draw upon a number of conversations that I've had with South Asians since I received this very kind uh, invitation. Let me begin by outlining some of the challenges. First, these buildings are now roughly 40 to 70 years old. This is the most vulnerable age for almost any building in almost any culture. They are too new to be widely appreciated as historic, and old enough to require expensive maintenance. And this is true, you know, if you have a 40-year-old house that you buy, uh, the first thing you do is put in a new bathroom and a kitchen. You know, who wants to have some, maybe in this room there would be some aficionados who'd want that 40-year-old kitchen, but I know a Van de Velde house in Brussels that uh, couldn't be sold because you pretty much were going to be stuck with the bathrooms and kitchens of 110 years ago, 120. Um, and to most people, of course, they appear old-fashioned. We think of these as modernism, but they are not new anymore. And that's much more evident to the younger people in the room than it is to me when I look at buildings that are now almost historic that I remember seeing going up. In South Asia, they have the additional disadvantage of being associated with governments that are often remembered for their inability to foster economic prosperity. And I think there's a really important difference here as well in what we think of as modern. These buildings are almost all civic buildings. Looking at that, you might think it's a commercial skyscraper, but it's in fact a civic office building. And most of the buildings in the show, not all of them, uh, are civic buildings, whereas most of what m most South Asians today would think of as new and modern are commercial structures, commercial real estate or commercial as office buildings or places or malls. Um, and so there's a real shift here in where the focus of people's idea of what is new and modern has, has become. 
Finally, as Mohit uh, Manohar, a graduate student at Yale, who's a fellow with me at the center this year, pointed out to me over uh, breakfast last week, because many of them are owned by the state, they're also particularly vulnerable to the desire on the part of current governments to impose their own stamp on the cityscape. It's not uh, a new idea that a prime minister um, or a president will want to have a prestige project. Many of these were, in fact, prestige projects in their own day. But try tearing down a uh, anything from a slum to an office building that's in private hands or occupied by large numbers of people in some way or another to build your prestige project. Very difficult. You're going to have pushback. You're not in control of the place. If it's on the site of a former civic building or government-owned site, regardless of how cherished those sites, those buildings may be to us, they're more vulnerable for that reason. It would be simple, it would be easy to simply deliver a rant this evening against the Philistines in power in each of these countries who are willing to pull down what we here in this room recognize as stunning examples of built heritage. That, however, will not change minds. And the minds of those in a position to make decisions, from political leaders to civil servants, often more important than political leaders, to, especially in post-colonial situations, as I know from Ireland, to ordinary voters is what is required here. Taking my lead from Minaraja Gopalam's admirable essay about which you've already seen a slide from Martino in the MoMA catalog, I would like to begin by suggesting although it may sound like heresy when stated at the lecture theater of one of the world's premier architecture schools, that we not think of these buildings primarily as the work of celebrated architects. I currently lead a research project that consider, reconsiders the role that women and members of ethnic minorities, principally but not exclusively African Americans, have had on the global dissemination of modern architecture and design between 1920 and 1970. And the purpose of that project is to argue for women like Ethel Power, who attended the Cambridge School rather than Harvard, and who is editor of House Beautiful, introduced a large American readership and six figures to the international style well before uh, the famous exhibition at MoMA, which was attended by many fewer people than had access to Powers articles. We need to think holistically about these buildings as the result of all the people who had agency in their creation. And Martino has spoken very well already about labor. IAM Omnibud, for instance, is as much the product of its masons, many of whom Amit Srivastava interviewed um, uh, years later, remembered that Louis Kahn had known them by name, and every time he would come to the site, he would go and look for specific Masons and greet them by name. And he didn't speak Gujarati, and they didn't speak English, but he learned their names, and they felt invested in this project probably more than he did, because it was their whole life as, a bil as builders, and, they, and he was designing other things other places. It also doesn't belong exclusively to Balkrishna Doshi and Anant Rajay, who actually had a major hand in the design. And my favorite part of the project is Rajay's. It's not actually a Khan design, although it's an inversion of a, a re revision of a Khan design. Or Kastor Bai uh, Labai and the Sarabai family. Um, whatever their style, none of these buildings are foreign. They were all built with South Asian labor and furthermore, because of a number of local circumstances, as Martino has alluded to, and so, of course, as Rahul, from climate to the availability of materials to the specific demands made by clients, very few could be easily mistaken for buildings anywhere else in the world. This building does not look like the Exeter Library, although the Exeter Library only looks the way it did because of all the time that Khan spent in South Asia. Secondly, as Raja Gopalam also instructs us, especially in her account of Kamala Poor Station in Dhaka, we have to remember the role that experiencing these places played in the lives of those who have used them, which in the case of this train station involves the millions who poured into the city from the countryside and then sometimes were fortunate enough to be able to return to their villages, at least for holidays. 
those who have scuttled like a rat, to quote Vincent Scully's famous words into Pennsylvania Station in New York, at least before its recent transformation, although you can still enter the rat light maze, which I did, trying to cut, get to MoMA as quickly as possible to see the exhibition a few weeks ago, can appreciate how fortunate, in at least this one way, Bangladeshis have been to have the much more uplifting experience of being sheltered by this system of thin shell concrete vaults. Architecture also provides important points of orientation and symbolism. If you Google images of the Pakistani capital of Islamabad, your screen is immediately filled with pictures of the Faisal Mosque, designed by an architect from Ankara and named for the Saudi king who paid for it long before the Gulf was flooded with South Asian construction labor. It is, as my doctoral student Kiran Gaya has helped me understand, now a powerful symbol of the city and indeed the nation including for many people who have no idea who designed or sponsored it. This even as the building's relatively late date, work began on Islamabad already in the late 1950s, suggests that the origins of a city named for the religion Pakistan was established to follow were actually originally largely secular. The mosque, thankfully, is in no danger, but other examples of modernist heritage certainly are. In her conversation with me, Shikha Jain emphasized the importance of civic engagement. Architects and architectural historians comprise in any society a well-educated, if not always well-paid, elite. Jain pointed out the degree to which the inhabitants of Chandigarh take proud in the, pride in their city, and indeed continued to do so at a time when it was out of fashion in schools like this one, which I'm old enough to remember. We need to foster public interest through outreach activities in communities that help politicians, government officials, and citizens to understand why these buildings matter. Pride can be developed through public programming for, that is intended to reach out to and really uh, enervate a large public. Open house fe festivals, for instance, have been extremely effective in Dublin in building appreciation and even pride in buildings that are not obviously easy to love. I show you the Donnybrook bus garage. Hundreds of people have queued up, even in the rain, to tour the interior of this building and to learn how innovative its structure was at the time. It was the first time that Ove Arup worked in Ireland. And the decoration on the vaults is by Patrick Scott, who started out as an architect before becoming one of Ireland's uh, leading abstract artists. Uh, well, public lectures and activities from, for children also help to deepen public awareness of the built environment. For Jane, one of the most effective ways of boosting pride is to work with international bodies, such as UNESCO and ICOMAS. They can, she says, offer important technical advice regarding conservation, but more important, she thinks, is probably the affirmation they provide that these buildings have, in UNESCO's terms, universal cultural value. Finally, we need, as architectural historians, to think about how we write the histories we tell. The contributions of South Asian scholars to post-colonial thought and to post-colonial histories of architecture are absolutely dazzling. But they can also be, may I, dare I say it, a little daunting. Architectural historians usually write for each other and for students. Adnan Morshed pointed out to me uh, over lunch last week that if the buildings about we, which we can be so passionate are to survive, we also need to write and speak in ways that excite and energize others to share this passion. In this context, being able to tell compelling stories about interesting people, something that has not been at the core of architectural history for a long time, matters enormously, even as we cannot simply revive the tired figures of heroic male architects. In Ireland, Eileen Gray is better known than Le Corbusier. Bert Beatrice Kalamina didn't believe me when I told her that when she was in Dublin, but it's true. And I, a lot of the students who come to study art history do so specifically because they so admire Eileen Gray. She's a cult figure celebrated by many far outside the architectural community for her far-sighted commitment to modernism, her embeddedness in Europe, and her 
unconventional personal life. Uh, one of her lovers, she used to, dri uh, used to drive her around Paris, uh, another woman with a panther in the car. So that's way more lively than ordinary life in Dublin all of which offer compelling alternatives to the parochial Irish nationalism of the middle decades of the last century. Minette, Minette de Silva, about whom you've already heard, had that kind of following among many, has that kind of following among many South Asian women architects. And as many of you already know, the proportion of female architects in the region is much higher than in most parts of the world, including this one. I was struck, having already decided to devote a chapter of my next book to her, how much more widely known Gira Sarabai became immediately following her death. Women, of course, only become really well known when they're over 80, if you follow the New York Times continually discovering new women artists. Uh -uh. I, when they're, if they're not one foot in the grave already, I certainly have decades and decades and decades of practice behind them and make me look like a, a spring chicken. Uh, so she died at the age of, uh, of 98. Um, and so she, for instance, many of my friends who know, did not know I was planning to write about her and do not necessarily know anything about architecture or South Asia sent her, sent me her obituary in the New York Times. I must have had it sent be by 20 people, right? Because they just figured out I would be interested in this. But it was interesting enough to be in the New York Times. She probably hadn't been mentioned in the New York Times before in her life. Sarah Bai was apparently an intensely private person who was a woman able to pursue a career in architecture because of her inherited wealth, had little reason to call attention to herself. While few of us will ever enjoy her enormous economic advantages, there is a fascinating story here about how she used them to inspire generations of artists, craftspeople, and design professionals from around the world and encouraged a dialogue between people of different cultures in which she presumed all could learn from each other. Identifying and popularizing such stories gives us yet another path forward. Thank you. Anyhow, um, I'm Eve Blau, and um, welcome to the, the Q&A part of this. Um, I, the, the talks so far have been really incredible. Uh, the exhibition is astounding. Um, I can't wait to go, actually. Uh, and um, the talk that you just gave, uh, Kathleen, about uh, women architects and the makers, uh, the materiality of the buildings, oh, thank you, <laughs> um, and all of those stories that are embedded in them that are a very important part of what the architecture means. Um, and I think uh, these are stories that I hope that you will uh, continue to tell and expand on. So. Um, at the same time, one of the things that, that I wanted to introduce just as a sort of kickoff uh, point here is um, one of the most interesting and I think uh, consequential aspects um, of the way in which Rahul has framed this conference. Uh, and just in general, um, as a frame for looking at modern architecture in South Asia, which was built during the um, the post-colonial decades, I'm particularly struck by, and I was thinking about this, um, that conservation as a lens shifts the focus and shifts the, the conversation from the past to the future. And that it, it kind of, the present is, is, a, is a sort of um, connector between them, but it really is, uh, instead of looking at this architecture in terms of uh, being specific to a period in time, it actually is about uh, what it means and, and about the future. And I think that that um, shift to the future uh, not only um, it raises a number of questions, actually, some of which have been articulated um, by Rahul and others, uh, and issues about you know what is preserved and what is not, uh, the incapability of current preservation policies and practices uh, to protect modern architecture. Why is that? Um, uh, and the politics of those 
those uh, policies, which uh, are also things that we have been addressing implicitly, and the lack of value, uh, the value or the lack of value that is placed on uh, the modern architectural legacy uh, in many parts of South Asia, and the historical narratives that are constructed to support those policies. So, to me, what the conservation lens really brings in uh, most sharply into focus is that the key question here is not so much what to preserve for the future as it is how to shape that future, actually. And I think how to make conservation an integral part of planning, something that Rahul has been talking about. And it seems to me um, to, and that's the projecting into the future, that planning is about uh, designing or, or thinking about and, and projecting uh, into the future. And it seems to me that it also involves um, a concept of transition as a constant uh, condition, as a permanent condition, that things are always changing. And I think ultimately also that uh, conservation is fundamentally an urban question. And I guess I would like to sort of pose that uh, in s sort of as a, as a kickoff question here, um, as we think about uh, conservation in the future tense, um, and also some of the things that, that Rahul has written about too, about urban space, that it is a space uh, of use, and we're talking about use here, uh, and we're talking about connections, vital connections to lives, uh, lived experience of people, and that thinking about it in this larger urban context is, it seems to me, something, it's a way, actually, of uh, embedding it and making it matter to people. And I think it also is something that has been a, a sort of conversation here. Um, which is that a lot of this architecture is institutional architecture. And so uh, there, there are a few things here. One of them is that cities, the exhibition is all about cities, and so it's transnational, and that's, that's an important part of what it's about. And then it's about institutions, and that somehow uh, focusing on these things and activating them as, uh, as ways of, um, approaching the whole issue of conservation might be uh, a way to kind of move forward. So that's a long-winded question. Was <laughs> oh, that a question? I thought you would just summarize what yeah. you were going to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know, Martino and Kathleen? Or... You go first. Well, I think one of the things that that prompts also is a consideration of sustainability in the urban context. And it's very interesting because in this country and in Europe, it, precisely this period is the period where buildings were designed without any attention to energy use whatsoever. And in Ireland, that is always the excuse for pulling down an office building for the 60s and 70s, is that you can build something, even when you think about the carbon footprint of tearing it down, you can build something that's going to use so much less energy. And so we are spending, I have another research project right now about reskinning these buildings instead and when the aesthetics of the matter and when they don't. But this is a period in which people couldn't afford that kind of energy in these countries. And people were thinking very hard about sustainability. Uh, that isn't the word they used at the time. But they were definitely thinking about uh, climate uh, a great deal. And so I think uh, that's another in that to try to think about how in times when these, these cities are now much hotter than they were when these buildings were built, nonetheless, what we can learn from them and, and how we can continue to work within that framework because the new modern in these places is all about air conditioning, uh, which has, uh, it certainly makes more life more comfortable on a, a very hot night, but it's not the way forward. And people's bodies almost forget how to live in this. And this was a, not the whole problem at IIM, but it was part of the problem that in the 60s when students came there, the idea of living in a, a student hostel, the dormitory that didn't have air conditioning, well, that was normal. And today, the students who get into IIM, uh, which is in a hotter, dry uh, climate than many of them are coming from, 
the idea that it's going to get that hot in Ahmedabad and there's, and there's not going to be air conditioning, you've got to be out of your mind. Um, and so those kinds of challenges are part of it as well. And uh, th this is where I think the past in one of the pla many places, the two of you will have many other good ideas about where the past and the future come together. Okay. I mean, I, I am wanted to maybe say something about your you know, notion, which is certainly correct, that the exhibition is uh, sort of very much, you know, focusing on institutional projects and, you know, sort of this statist focus that we give, and that's certainly true. And, you know, I think it's important to understand that it's not because of, say, a predilection towards bigness. Of course, you know, that's also great to have, you know, big buildings that really, you know, um, you know just blow you away by their s simple material presence. But I think what we, you know, were interested in was to remind uh, audiences that, you know, architecture really cannot thrive without clients. Uh, clients who are, um, you know, enlightened and who have, a, um, who have a vision of the future. And, you know, in that period um, of post-independence, obviously, that the primary client was the state. These were mainly countries that were leaning, you know, strongly socialist, so there was a strong centralization of power. There was the notion of transforming agrarian societies through industrialization, through urbanization. Yeah. And of course, industrialization, urbanization, modernization, or you know this, uh, you know, just uh, triad of, of of things that you know just uh, co-aligned. There is, however, of course, also you know the interesting um, uh, story of private uh, patronage, specifically in Ahmedabad. Uh, mm -hmm. You know the Sarabais, uh, you know that Gira came out of among other, uh, you know, important families. We're not, again, ex very explicitly addressing this, but we are, you know, sort of mentioning it here and there. And so, you know, I think this is really important for me um, as, a, as, as somebody who lives in the contemporary world, but who has a strong, you know, as a historian in interest in this post-war period. I think it was also, you know, visible in the Yugoslavia exhibition a few years ago, that I really feel that, you know, architecture should and can be more than uh, just a, you know, pastime for the happy few, for the wealthy people, but it actually can embody, you know, a social vision, a societal vision. And, um, you know, I think that brings us to the other question that actually all of us, you know, addressed here. So how do we make sure that the people that, you know, uh, the architects are hoping and to build for actually agree with, you know, those hopes and, you know, understand what, what this is all supposed to be about? Yeah, Eve, I mean, I'll just sort of pick up on some of the things you said. Uh, just three quick comments. One is, you know, this idea that conservation, and I prefer using that to preservation because it's sort of broader and more holistic, uh, is but an instrument of planning that helps modulate the rate of change, right? Which also then takes us to the question of the urban versus the autonomous object of the building and architecture in developing these narratives, correct? And uh, so I think that interrelationship is very critical because often uh, when we try developing these narratives around the building, well, they are useful, uh, but when we also talk about broadening the constituencies that might appreciate this, uh, I think embedding it in broader processes of the urban, the context is, is, is very critical, the social as well as the physical. Uh, and uh, so sort of leading from that is this idea, I think Martino just sort of underlined it, the status patron. So the question of how the state wants to look, right? Uh, which was what a lot of that patronage was driven by, which is also precisely, especially in South Asia, the contestation today, because now the state wants to look different, right? And I think uh, what you sort of showed us, Kathleen, of that 
building uh, in Calcutta, right, mm -hmm. uh, is exactly about that question. I mean, you framed it as not modern enough in the context of today and for all the various reasons you've described. But it's also this sort of underlying aspiration of the state and how it wants to look. Uh, and in, in India, I know for sure, and I think this is true for many parts of South Asia, this kind of tyranny of images of being the world-class city, of the global city, those are now overtaking uh, the earlier ambitions of how the state wanted to be represented. And that is the huge contestation that is occurring when one is trying to develop these narratives about conservation of modern architecture. And if I may add one thing about that as well, is that uh, the state now is taking its cue partly from the South Asian past, but also from yes. the South Asian current commercial architecture, which is itself largely taking its cue from Dubai, Singapore, maybe Jakarta, maybe Kuala Lumpur, and certainly Hong Kong, Beijing, uh, not so much Beijing actually, as uh, Shanghai and Guangzhou. And so from commercial places, the state is not taking its cue from any democracies, including you know, other that's democracies right. in the global south, and from civic architecture at all. And I think that's a really interesting problem as well. How do you represent South Asian democracy when it exists? Uh, how do you represent the democracy of the global south? Uh, because you have some success here in, in that, and that's not being represented. That's not how even democracies are representing themselves, mm -hmm. much less the states that are have a more complicated relationship with democracy. And I guess that that's one of the things that um, I was thinking about in terms of uh, not necessarily scale, but the sense of locality and of buildings belonging to place. Uh, and also that that's um, a way of uh, possibly increasing a sense, of, a broader sense of ownership, mm -hmm. actually, sort of taking modern architecture out of the hands of the state, um, both, uh, you know, in terms of being able to destroy it, too, and, and a kind of investment in it on the part of people who have nothing to invest. Um, but also uh, thinking of it as, as uh, thinking of architecture, uh, again, as, as like the urban space uh, of the city, um, and also that it is uh, sort of transforming. And I think one of the, the ideas that I think is interesting in terms of conservation is, um, you know, there's a, the, the idea of alteration being a part of conservation, that you have to change things and that things change, and that change is a constant. So I don't know. No, I, yeah. it, Well, just look at Memorial Hall across the way. There's an addition by Venturi and Scott Brown that made it possible for people in wheelchairs to use that space. It just got a new slate roof that looks like the old one, but you have both. You need, you replace something that's worn out over 100 years with something that look, looks like the past, but you also change the building. It didn't matter when that building was built, even though it commemorates the Civil War that maimed and wounded so many young men from this campus, that uh, it wasn't wheelchair accessible when it was built. So these kinds of changes have to be accommodated in, in any situation if these buildings are going to stay alive. Um, as I say, I mean, even here, I doubt you have the original plumbing, <laughs> and I doubt anybody would want to keep that. And so you have to figure out which things need which things you can let go of and not be precious about to keep, to keep things alive. Yeah. And you know, I mean, I, just to sort of extend that, it, I think it's also interesting, uh, the context, well, let's just sort of simplify it and say global north and south or the west, uh, where the impulses to conserve came out of the world wars, it came out of many other conditions. Um, uh, and also craft was decimated, so therefore the swing was to an extreme preservation. Uh, in traditions in Asia, South Asia in particular, but many parts of Asia, where traditions are living and continuous, uh, the alterations you speak about, the repair, so, so maybe the fact that we even use the rubric of preservation and conservation is already heavy-handed, right? Because if you also, if you use the word repair, alteration, it, it's quite different how you might engage with it. And, and you know, even when one looks at the canons for preservation, and when you have traditions that are continuous, 
instance, uh, what you alter and how you alter uh, actually completely vary. Uh, and we don't have enough of a framework uh, to guide that process yet. Uh, we are yet relying on the canons of the West in terms of what we are calling preservation. So I think that is an interesting question to interrogate too. You know, I think the, the, the category of ownership that you brought up is really key in this conversation. Because, you know, I don't think anybody of us would argue for sort of sort of the stigma, dogmatic idea of preservation or conservation of sort of isolating an object and, you know, basically putting it into a box and just stopping time, you know, and I think one of the beautiful things um, for me in this in this in this multi-year research project was also to learn to understand how many of these buildings very very successfully have become part of everyday life for many people. You know, flower market uh, by Kuldeep Singh in, in in Bangalore, or you know many of the housing projects that were government run, uh, built and were actually built for government employees or. <laughs> you know, m many of the administrative buildings and so on and so forth, schools, hospitals, universities, and, you know, I, those are the things that, you know, I think allow us to understand that preservation can actually be something very alive. And, you know, and I, I do believe that the, the notion of ownership is, 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 is very, very key. When people have, a, a, you know, a, a possibility to, to identify with, with the project, make it their own, bring it, you know, appropriate and, you know, make it part of their lives. That, I think, is, you know, when we have the most successful, you know, so common sense uh, of, 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 of what, you know, how, how modernity and modernism, you know, can be successful and preserved. Well, I think that it, that's something, Rahul, that you have talked about um, in, in your books uh, about how uh, buildings, you know, in the city and spaces are constantly being appropriated for other uses. Mm -hmm. And this notion that things are, that, that architecture is open to that uh, and that it um, supports that mm -hmm. and that it, that is supported uh, seems to me to be a vital way to, to think about conservation in that context. Well, yeah, absolutely, where you begin, I mean, uh, Martino referred to the stadium in Ahmedabad, which right now we're working with the World Monument Fund to create a preservation or conservation plan. And I was stunned when we talked to the Municipal Corporation of Ahmedabad for what they wanted to do in the stadium. And they gave me a list that had 50 things which had nothing to do with, beyond cricket, which is what the stadium was <laughs> originally intended for. And it, it's exactly what you're saying. And you know, of course, it was a process of negotiation in terms of what can be accommodated and not, but what is reversible, what are soft uses. It actually, it, it expands the associations with the building. So then you begin to see the building as an armature which can contain things on a kind of ephemeral, temporal cycle. Uh, and uh, it gives it completely new meaning. Now, if you look at the purest canons of preservation or conservation, that would seem like an infringement on the significance. Uh, and that's why I sort of use the word, we have to also, if we have to deal with the transitions you're describing, uh, Eve, we have to also construct significance. And then uh, the, 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 the job of the conservator becomes complicated because what you're doing is keeping the integrity of the architect. You're walking a much finer line, tight rope, because you keep the integrity of the illusion of the architect intact while allowing it to accommodate other things which expand the associated values with the building which then ensure that it lives longer in a sense. So I think that uh, th that, um, uh, that balance, that kind of hybrid uh, condition uh, is I think the challenge for the future for many buildings in South Asia particularly where density, uh, changing regimes and their aspirations as Kathleen was describing uh, threaten these buildings in much more severe ways than the West where the pressures on the building are sometimes much less. You know, I wonder in that connection whether um, the sort of functionalist uh, ideology of modern architecture has been sort of operating against that kind of thing, that, that there is a, a, an ethos, or it is certainly the, the, the sort of uh, 
ideological, the underpinnings of modernism is that, it, that this is functional architecture and that it performs or it, it supports certain functions. And the idea that those functions should change uh, and that the building should accommodate those is something that goes against a kind of modernist idea of architecture. But it doesn't go against the way many of these buildings were designed. Yes. Because I think partly for climate reasons and partly because of the heritage that they were actually channeling in abstract means, many of these buildings are much more open than that. Um, and certainly uh, that gives some of the flexibility to how they can be used. Yeah. And, and also the way in which they're produced, as, as you've all talked about. Um, opening to the audience, um, are there questions, comments? Um, yeah. yeah. Actually, Use the mic, please. Um, hello. Um, thank you for the chat. Um, I could not be here in the first half, so I'm sorry if I missed this particular aspect. Um, my question is specifically about the Central, uh, Central Vista project um, in New Delhi right now. Um, what are your thoughts about political implications on conservation? Because we're essentially retiring an, al an almost uh, completely functional building that is our par parliament, which is also an essential, quite an essential part of the fabric of Delhi. Um, the capital of India. Um, what are your thoughts about politics playing a part in the conservation? How should it essentially be handled? There's essentially a lot of grandstanding around this. Um, and I understand that this is a very contentious <laughs> subject as well, but um, what should the old parliament now be used for? Like, uh, how can we conserve it? Well, I think the first thing is for me, it's very difficult for me to tell somebody in a democratic country how they should be proceeding. So I think there's the issue that, that has, this has got to be a conversation above all among Indian citizens. And, not, and that's, I'm an overseas citizen of India, but that comes without voting rights, and it, I shouldn't have voting rights. Um, so I think that's itself complicated, but I think that, um, in this case, it may be too late. Uh, I don't know. But I, I also think that the solution, as I tried to suggest in my remarks over the long term, is building a strong association uh, uh, between the institutions that a building represents and the building. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really interesting in that context to look at countries where the parliament building really means almost nothing to people, um, as in Ireland, where it's an appropriated house that has been used for many different things over its history, and the parliament is not the longest thing in its history and won't be for a long time to come, or the fact that in many parts of the world people can re recognize the United States Capitol, which in a form that was not its original form. How do you make these buildings stand for what you under, what you understand it to stand for, how do you make that understanding more general? What kinds of education, involvement, um, some of that is just the happenstance of what happens in a particular building at a particular time. The Lincoln Memorial stands for something very different in American culture today than it did before Marian Anderson gave her concert and before Martin Luther King gave his speech. But how do you, how do you embed those? And to be thinking about the different constituencies one has to reach out to. And in this case, this isn't the specialized situation of dormitories at one university. This is a, a building that is the symbol of a, of a democracy of one billion people. Um, and so I, I'm not comfortable giving you the answer um, from my perspective, but I am comfortable saying that it's got to be a process that makes there be some kind, ideally you build consensus. Now we've just seen an attack on the U.S. Capitol, a very violent one, so clearly there's not consensus here. 
But I think one of the reasons that was so surprising to my neighbors in Ireland, which is where I was when it took place, was because it was associated with stability um, over a longer period than Ireland or India has had a democracy. Although, of course, it was built in the middle of a civil war as a symbol, uh, a unifying symbol in that context. So I've given a rather garbled answer, and I know I haven't given what you want to hear, but I think um, that there aren't, that simply saying, oh, I'm appalled, doesn't fix the problem. And, and that's the other thing I worry about. Um, and I also think that in the case of IIM, for me as a scholar of Louis Kahn, who'd spent, gone through every drawing he made for it, I could speak as an expert in a different way than I can speak in this case. And I, um, uh, although of course I've seen the building, I've been up and down the Raj path, you know, the, um, so, so I, I'm not giving you what you want, but I hope that I, I can begin to offer a possible, one possible path of a process. I. I just want to clarify that I'm not doing so, but you know, I'm just a false idea. I know. I'm just a false idea. Now what I'm in more interested in is just generally understanding how politics plays in uh, plays a role in conservation, but also like what could potentially happen to uh, the old parliament, because I think it's all about moving forward rather than moving backward. And, and, and I think thinking yeah. about the most possibly compelling use that would unif bring together the most people behind it, whatever that might be, is the way to get it through the next generation could become a museum of democracy, <laughs> which is maybe what democracy will need very soon anyway. I mean, you know, I, I agree with everything, you know, that you just said, Kathleen. However, <laughs> I do think as, you know, scholars and historians of architecture, we must have a voice and say, and at least say, you know, we raise our concern. Mm. And of course, this is complicated. Who are we, you know, you know, these Westerners telling Indian, you know, citizens what to do, especially in a situation where the building, you know, essentially the parliament building is a, was a colonial imposition. I mean, we're not talking about something that happened as a democratic process. So that, you know, I think we would almost redouble, uh, you know, that sort of imposition. But nevertheless, I do think it is our duty to raise concern and, you know, uh, try to raise awareness for the qualities of that, you know, existing urban um, design and its, you know, ability and, uh, you know, um, yeah, its ability to house the functions of democracy for which it was conceived, which, you know, the new project may or may not do. Maybe you take another one more yeah. question. Um, Okay. Uh, hi, <coughs> I'm Daniel. Um, my well, thanks so much for the little mini talks and for all of the work on the exhibition. Um, my question is a little bit more addressed towards the exhibition and Martino, I guess, a little bit. Um, what I'm missing a little bit, or maybe a little bit troubled by is the treatment of partition itself. Um, I think you talk a lot about, and the exhibition accounts for questions of decolonization, of nation building as an optimistic project, which it was. Um, but I'm missing a little bit the, the catastrophe of, of partition. Um, and I, I wonder, whether, I mean, I'm, I'm yet to visit and, I, and I'm going in a couple of weeks, but does it address, or how, how do we address um, how all of this has been built onto the ruins and destruction of a 
confounding violence, you know, the severance of an entire population of people, dispossession, occupation, and, and those have resulted in very specific architectural problems, you know, in 1947, whether that was um, the ruins of, of evacuation or the need suddenly to house millions of people. Um, and you talk a little bit, or you talked a little bit about the assumption of the exhibition um, as the state, as the primary client, and I wonder how sort of this question of the, 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 the violence of partition poses a counterpoint to that. You know, that's a very good and important question, and I'm actually curious to hear what the visitors to the show have to say to that. As a curator, uh, I would say we address this front and central uh, in the following way. The first thing you will encounter going into, into, the, into the exhibition after the, of the banner that I showed is a small photograph by Margaret Burke White, who was an American photographer working for Life magazine, and he, she was present on the ground when partition happened, and she photographed you know, families who had to flee, and there were millions. And um, it's a small photograph, but it's on itself, uh, on a wall, and it's a family moving, you know, fleeing um, uh, to Pakistan. And I think it sets the tone that, you know, obviously, yes, we are um, in the end um, presenting a, an idea of progress or, you know, social optimism, but it is one that is firmly grounded on an, a, a, a trauma, a, a huge catastrophe, humanitarian catastrophe. And the, you know, partition then, I think, is very, very present in the first two chapters of the exhibition, New Cities. You know, the fact that, you know, we're showing Chandigarh as then basically the next image after the, um, the Margaret Burke White's photograph is also to indicate that the story of Chandigarh is one of partition. It is the, the reason for Chandigarh is that the Indian part of the Punjab no longer had a capital because Lahore ended up on the Pakistani side. Hence, you know, the reason the need to build a new capital for that uh, state. And then, you know, housing, where we actually have a lot of, uh, you know, housing projects that directly were built for refugees on both sides, on both sides of the, uh, of, of the border. So I do think we address it um, within, you know, the possibilities of what an architecture exhibition is. Um, and, you know, uh, I personally feel that this, you know, um, less is more in a way in just letting that one image speak on on this empty wall i think works very well for me but i'm actually curious to hear your, your thoughts yeah no i mean i think uh, you mentioned housing and new cities and i think there's a lot of emphasis on housing uh, and that actually was a critical instrument for the governments on all sides to try to solve the problem. Now, the problem accelerated in urban centers because of distress migration, uh, which didn't directly come out of the partition, but came out of structural problems in nation building. Um, but housing is, I think, uh, well represented in the exhibition as this instrument in response to the dislocations that the partition offered. And in the essay I've done in the catalog, in fact, that is the central theme uh, in explaining the decisions that were made. Yeah, yeah. I actually want to mention the story. The catalog okay. also actually has a separate essay, essay by yeah. Nonika Datta, who is a very, you know, um, famous historian of partition based in Delhi. Sorry, I didn't want to. I, think I was just going to point to that same essay, so you did it. That was my answer. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I think we have one more question. Yeah, you could. This one day. Oh, sorry. Oh. Hi, um, just had a couple of sort of thoughts as I heard this uh, excellent presentation. And I should preface this by saying it's completely kind of a man on the street view because I've got no expertise in architecture. Um, so I just sort of, you know, some thoughts that I wanted um, if uh, you could you could comment on. Uh, the first thing, and I should say I'm, I'm from Pakistan, so a lot of it is very much Pakistan focused, uh, my comments. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to sort of ask and posit is that, you know, and it came through a lot of the pictures that you showed that a lot of the buildings that were built during the 60s or the, or the 70s have aged really badly. 
and that's very much the case in in Pakistan. How does that kind of fit into uh, the question of conservation? Uh, because you know, in 30, 40 years, uh, they begin to look pretty bad, actually. You know, so what's you know how how, how does that fit in? The other thing uh, that I wanted to also talk about is that a lot of this, uh, at least in Pakistan, and in some cases, the question is of functionality. And of course, you know, um, a couple of you have just mentioned the fun functionality, but it just reminded me of a conversation in Lahore, where uh, one uh, government official said that it's much easy to refit, let, let alone a British era building, it's much easier to refit a Mughal building to modern use than it is to use a modern building for modern for current current use. And that, you know, that comment just came to my, my mind and the person said, I'd rather work with a Mughal building than with something that was built in the 70s because that's completely uh, very hard to re-fashion. Uh, uh, so, you know, that's, I think, another uh, very interesting aspect. Uh, the third thing that I wanted to sort of highlight which um, one, of the, one of the presenters also spoke on and the professor actually commented on it, that a lot of these buildings are state projects. And it just occurred to me that maybe one of the reasons why people don't kind of connect to it is because looking at them reminds them of the state's failure in so many ways. And that is why, you know, that connection that a lot of you have been talking about, you know, how should people react to it, that just doesn't work out. You know, and in some ways, you know, that speaks to the first question. You know, when there's that image of independent India, it's of the Indian Parliament building. Is Jawaharlal Nehru in front of it with Lord Mountbatten and millions of people? That's the iconic image that refashioned the whole thing that it was a colonial building. Now it was the face of independent India. Sadly, that doesn't happen with these modern modern buildings, and I think that kind of creates. Um, a question there. And the last thing that I wanted to uh, point out, and this is very, very a uh, Pakistani uh, uh, question, and this comes from a student of mine who actually did a paper on this a couple of years ago, but that, that was an undergraduate paper, but it raised a question which was very interesting. So what he did was that he picked three structures, one from Lahore, one from Karachi, and one from Isla Is Islamabad, all built from the 1970s onwards, and asked people what it meant to them. And no one was able to answer it. They just said, they're buildings. Uh, and the three I can even tell you, uh, one was the mausoleum of uh, Jinnah in Karachi, uh, the second was the Pakistan monument in Lahore, and the third was Faisal Mosque in, is in Islamabad that you just, just, just saw. And the person said, yeah, they're just buildings, nice buildings. And I say, but what does it mean to you? And the person interviewed about 50 odd people in all these three cities, and it didn't connect to them at all. And when the person asked, how do Mughal buildings connect to you? Even the most sort of common person would say, oh, yeah, well, Mughal architecture is about X, Y, and Z, and it's about, you know, the gardens are about heaven and this, that, and the rest. And that thing uh, in the paper that my student argued, he pointed out two things which I thought were very interesting. One is that at least in Pakistan, all these structures were made by, uh, well, primarily by Turkish pe people. So a lot of the idea was that these Turkish architects are actually coming in and kind of showing things, and it didn't really have, have a local connection. And the other thing was that the people really, you know, didn't connect, didn't really understand what they were. So do you think that, again, plays a part in this conversation? Because again, you know, and I'm very keen that, you know, these need to be conserved rather than just preserved as, as uh, some markers of an age gone, gone by. But when we're talking about conservation, I think these are the elements that we need to kind of consider and react to. Well, that's a lot, but I mean, I can just, yeah, I can, uh, yeah, that's another, yeah, that's, yeah, I can get your undergraduate students to work on this now. But uh, uh, no, no, just two things. I mean, I think you talked about, in a sense, implied materiality, because you alluded to the, the Mughal buildings, and they're easier to retrofit than the modern buildings, right? So, I mean, I think one of the kind of uh, choices, and you know, in, in some ways, Corbusier settled all these debates with Chandigarh, uh, exposed concrete, concrete as a material. There was already an industry developing for it. It actually accelerated the kind of universalizing impulse that modernism sort of played out in India, right? So you began to have a material across incredibly diverse climates, uh, diverse geographies, with diverse ecologies, uh, all being built in the same material. And that's the weathering that you're alluding to, uh, you know, accelerated by the f fact that the state 
patronize these buildings and had no interest or abilities or capacities to maintain them, correct? So they actually, while they're buildings in concrete, they're very fragile in some ways compared to the more robust British-built colonial buildings uh, as well as the Mughal buildings, correct? So that sort of, to your second point, you know, Devesh Kapoor, who's a political scientist, had one answer, asked me, how do you think the state should look? And this relates to your question. And you know, the example he gave me was very interesting. He said, in a small town, if you go to the local court, it usually is around a courtyard or the battening tree or a tree in the center. People sit around it. Families wait in the corridors and in the, in the verandas. It's not even double-loaded corridors while justice is being sort of, you know, decided upon in a sense. Whereas modern buildings are these sort of boxes uh, which don't welcome anyone. And so he was asking this question about how the state should look, which is what we were discussing earlier. Uh, and you know, it's, it's actually fundamental in ways it can embrace people through different functions. So I mean, all I'd say in summary is there was a kind of universalizing impulse through modernism. Uh, in a way, it became a style. There was a disjuncture that the larger ecology within which these buildings were set, whether it was the social modernization process, whether there were material flow systems, et cetera, were not in place. They were just this implant, very talented architects doing wonderful buildings uh, with the next generation beginning to struggle with making their modernism relevant to localities, right, as you see in the next generations. Uh, but this disjuncture, I think, is now what the present generation is dealing with in terms of the questions of conservation, which become very complex. Two very brief answers, one about monumentality, the other one about identity. I think it's a mistake to compare Mughal architecture to modern architecture, because we're talking about Mughal architecture is royal architecture that was built for eternity. We're talking about the tiniest fraction of construction back you know, in the day that survived. Let's, you know, all the buildings that were built during the Mughal period for everyday people, you know, they're no longer there. And, you know, it's a, so it's complicated. You know, if you compare a Mughal, a Mughal palace that people identify with, that they're proud of because they relate to their history and so on, you know, you, you have to also then relate it to the most, uh, you know, representational uh, buildings that were built in the modern time and not to, you know, the, the, the everyday modernism that was all about. The idea was never that these, you know, these buildings would be built for eternity. So I think it's yeah. a bit unfair to make that comparison. I also, you know, um, this brings me to the second question of identity, which is, of course, related to monumentality. What is a monument? A monument is a place where people agree, you know, they sort of represent a larger idea of themselves. And, um, you know, I actually visited Faisal Mosque um, on a Saturday afternoon two years ago in January 2020. And it was yeah, built by, uh, by a Turkish architect, um, which is one of the reasons that it's not in the exhibition. Instead, we have Anwar Said's uh, buildings. But you know, I actually felt this was an event. There were many, many families with their grandparents, with their children, spending the afternoon there enjoying the building. So I actually would contest a little bit your, 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 your you know, idea that modern modernity doesn't speak to people. I think it does that sometimes very, very strongly strongly, and I experienced it at the Faisal Mosque. Uh, and I've never been to Pakistan, but I have a student working on Islamabad right now who I think is there at the moment. The last pictures I got were from Lahore a few days ago, so he should now have reached. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting, um, I think that, that there were, it's, it's interesting to compare it with Shandigar because Shandigar immediately had such, uh, because of, I, in part because it was Le Cabousier, who was a, a talented self-publicist and in whom there was already a great deal of interest, it had such international resonance from the beginning. And Islamabad was not the project that everybody in the rest of the world watched. Um, and so, it's very interesting to look at the difference between something that is designed from the beginning to have international valence and a project that may have been designed for it, but they didn't know quite how to achieve that and it never quite did that. It's not in every textbook. Um, and I don't know, 
I mean, certainly in, in other parts of India, not everybody who's not the kind of person who would come to an event like this, not interested in architecture, would think of Chandigar as the most important symbol of post-independence India, but it's what most American architecture students know about post-independence India. I think it's very, um, I do think these are in a particular time zone where they're, they're, where they look aged and haven't attracted that kind of care and look out of date. And there is this political problem very much as well as I tried to allude to. Uh, but I also think modernist monuments have been a challenge anyway. Mm -hmm. And it, interestingly, of course, Chandigarh is the famous example of modernist monumentality that whether or not it works as a building, it works as an image, at least in architecture schools around the globe and has since 1960. But the modernist monumentality is really largely a postmodern uh, situation with a country like Germany, in which I've also worked. Um, there are not a lot of really successful modernist monuments. And interestingly, one of them is in the show, a very small monument to Gandhi in Calcutta, uh, which I've walked past many times and come to very much appreciate in the understated way in which an architect, actually of Muslim background, is channeling um, Hindu temples, but in an abstract modern way that is, turns out to be respectful, I think, of Gandhi, for whom one would not want something huge, respectful of the Hindu roots of his, uh, of many of his political practices, but broader than that mm -hmm. and inclusive. Uh, but it's very modest and it's not the most famous image in Calcutta, which is the Victoria Memorial. Uh, and which is actually an example also of how associations can change over time. Because I was quite surprised about how nostalgic my husband is for the Victoria Memorial. And it's not because he thinks it's great architecture, because it, but it was because it's a large public park to which, as a treat, they got driven to play in, where you could throw a ball further and run around further, and it had nothing to do with Queen Victoria, had nothing to do with the building, but it had everything to do with the space. Uh, which was just, the, I mean, there's a huge mine on there. There's more space around it. But this was the space that was a treat to go to. And it's precisely these changing significances that we've got to map and draw our narratives from. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Speakers.